Good morning and welcome to worship here at New Bethel Baptist Church. We're so glad you're joining us today. We want you to sing along with the praise team. Grab your Bible and let's get ready to study God's Word. Let's worship together. Faithfulness is what I long for. 
this is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Righteousness is what you want from me. Take my heart. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform. Again, good morning. We're continuing our series on true and false from the book of 2 Peter today in chapter 2. So you may want to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to that chapter. I want to start off today with three familiar stories from Scripture. The first is from Genesis 3, the second from Numbers 22, and the third is from John chapter 2. Genesis 3 is the story of the fall of man. Now, in that story, the serpent, who represents Satan, speaks to Eve and says, Did God actually say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Eve answers, We can't eat from the tree in the center of the garden. All the other trees are great. But that one, if we eat it, God said we'd die. Then the serpent Satan replies, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Over in Numbers chapter 22, the king of Moab, a man named Balak, has sent for a priest named Balaam. Balak is... um, terrorized by the size of the Hebrew nation that's moving toward his land on their way to the promised land. Balak, the king, wants Balaam to curse Israel so that he'll be able to defeat them in battle. After inquiring of the Lord, Balaam is told that the Hebrew people are blessed and that he should not go. Well, Balak sends a second delegation with an offer basically of any amount of money that he asks in payment for a curse on Israel. 
after inquiring of the Lord a second time, Balaam uh, agrees to go, but the Lord is not happy. Uh, it's one of those, we'll go if you want to, but you're going to face the consequences if you go kind of things. Balaam heads that way. On the way, the Lord sends an angel to intercept Balaam. Two times, Balaam's donkey that he's riding on turns away from the angel. The third time, the donkey just lays down. Each time, Balaam whips the poor donkey. After the third time of getting whipped, the donkey is given a human voice. In Numbers chapter 2, verse 28 through 31, we pick up with the donkey getting its voice. And she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me. I wish I had my sword in my hand, then I would just kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? Balaam said, no. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And then the third story is from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. In that passage, we observe Jesus going to Jerusalem for the first Passover after he begins his public ministry. It says the Passover of the, Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. And to everyone he said, do not make my father's house a house of trade or a marketplace. So what are these three stories? A talking snake, a talking donkey, and Jesus cleansing the temple. What do they have to do with Peter and the false teacher? Well, Peter certainly knows the Old Testament stories. He's heard them since he was a child, may have even taught them himself. And he was present when Jesus began his ministry by demonstrating his zeal, Jesus' zeal for the Lord's house and his opposition to corruption. Peter has these images in mind when, when he thinks of false teachers that are infecting the church. Now, let me give you one more image to consider. Have you ever seen professional wrestling? Not, not, not Olympic wrestling on a big wide flat mat. Professional wrestling where they have a ring and ropes. <laughs> well, in today's passage, Peter climbs to the top ring rope. And he flies through the air doing an atomic pile driver on the reputation of the false teachers. <laughs> Seriously. This is a major confrontation and condemnation of those who would do harm to God's church. Let's pick up in the second sentence of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed 
children. Now look at verse 17. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Now we'll pick up the rest of that chapter in just a few moments. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look into your word today. Lord, help us to recognize truth. We know your word is true, and when we hear someone teaching from your word or about your word, Father, help us to be able to compare our experience with you and with your word so that we can verify the truth. Give us an understanding of truth, Lord, please. Today we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What's your favorite verse of Scripture? What passage from the Bible would you maybe have framed and hung on your wall of your house? I, I doubt very seriously if it would be 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter is confronting evil in this chapter. Just as much as when Jesus confronted the hypocrisy of the Pharisees who were making burdensome rules, which ordinary people couldn't follow. He, he called them whitewashed tombs and blind guides. Here, Peter's confronting false teachers. And, and well, calling them blind guides would be mild compared to Peter's actual words that we just read. I wonder if Peter didn't reflect on how Jesus handled the corruption of the temple when he's thinking about these false teachers. If you read through the Gospels, you would see that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at the end of his ministry, during the final week before the crucifixion, Jesus cleansed the temple. Then you get to the fourth Gospel, the Gospel of John, where Jesus cleansed the temple very early in his ministry. At the beginning and at the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus was concerned with the corruption of those who were supposed to be leading. The leadership of the temple actually encouraged people to not bring sacrifices from their homes. They wanted people to buy them at the temple. See, they got a cut from the sale of sacrifice animals. The temple only accepted a Jewish shekel coin in the offering. The common money that was in use in everyday world was a Roman denarius. To make your offering, you had to go to the temple and exchange your denarius for shekels. This too was a money-making racket for the temple officials. Worship had become an industry. Sacrifice had become a business. Jesus saw this and found it completely unacceptable. And on at least two occasions, he stopped them from doing that. Peter is equally offended that someone would attempt to corrupt the gospel. Last week, we saw that he called them sneaky. They were not up front about what they were doing. This section of chapter 2 describes where they are false and also what is true. We're going to call this the truth about false teachers. The first thing that's false about them is they have false pride. False pride. It says bold and willful. That's Peter's shorthand for the pride, the arrogance of these false teachers. While they were sneaky in what they were teaching, they were arrogant in their approach. They're not shy about pursuing places of leadership or of making themselves out to be experts in interpretation of theology. The rest of verse 10 and verse 11 says they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. The, the word blaspheme here is used three times in this passage. The word means to revile or to slander. 
literally it means to make light of. In this case, it appears they're making light of angelic beings. Both those from God, the glorious ones. That's a way of saying heavenly beings or angels. They're making fun or making light of the angelic host. They fail to recognize the glory offered to the angels who serve in the very presence of God. And, and at the same time, the inference here is that they're downplaying evil. They're making light of demonic influences. Uh, their blaspheming includes fallen angels. They make light of the demonic, which makes perfect sense to me. Why would they teach on the dangers of evil when they're playing for that team? If we are fooled into underestimating our enemy, then we're more susceptible to being drawn into our enemy's schemes. When Peter calls these false teachers willful, he's saying they are self-willed, living only to please themselves. They certainly do not have the best interests of those they're trying to fool. That's their false pride. Peter then explains their true value. Verse 12, but these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. At the end of the chapter, Peter compares them to dogs and to pigs. Dogs were rarely domesticated and certainly not highly valued like today. And the Jewish people, Peter's people, had no use for pigs whatsoever. When I read this description of their value in verse 12, my initial thought was of wild hogs. In many places in our country, there are wild pigs, wild hogs, and they're such a nuisance. They're so numerous that there's no hunting season for them and no limit on how many can be killed. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 6, Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and then turn and attack you. We can't give false teachers what is valuable or a valuable place in our lives. We cannot learn holiness from people who are not holy. They should not influence us because they have false thinking. Verse 12 continues, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. The Phillips translation of the Bible of verse 12 says, they scoff at things outside their own experience. Warren Wiersbe in his commentary on this passage reminds us of an old saying, empty barrels make the most noise. We don't need to focus for ourselves. We don't need to focus on the big mouths. Rather, in Scripture, we're encouraged to listen to the still, small voice. We need to pursue truth, which is designed to build us up, and not propaganda, which is designed for corruption. That's what their false thinking was, and that leads to their true destiny. They will also be destroyed in their destruction. Verse 13 says, suffering wrong is the wages for their wrongdoing. Now, there's, there's nothing complicated about this. They will be punished by God. There's a, a bit of a poetic kind of verse in this line with the way the things are doubled up. The picture is, as they're attempting to destroy others, they will be Destroyed, And as they seek wages for their teaching, they'll be paid in suffering loss. What we need to remember here is that there will be judgment. And that judgment will have as evidence these false teachers' intentions, their actions, and their deception. The next thing we see in this passage is their false pleasure. 
It, it says they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. These folks are partiers. That's what the word revel means. They're, they're partiers. Uh, they, they're partying during the daytime. They're not hard workers. Unlike Paul the tent maker, they're not working during the day and teaching in the evenings. These folks party in the daytime, and then they bring that party attitude into the church. Even on those more somber occasions, like the Lord's Supper. And what does Peter have to say about their false pleasure? That represents their true perversion. In verse 13, he calls them blots and blemishes. And then he says they have eyes full of of adultery, insatiable for sin. The love feast that's mentioned is a regular part of the New Testament era church. It was a shared meal that then concluded with the Lord's Supper. We might think of it as having the Lord's Supper as a part of a potluck dinner. Part of the purpose was so that the poorest members and the richest members would be sitting at the same table, enjoying a meal, and through that they would build unity and they would be able to demonstrate brotherly love. These false teachers, rather than any of those motivations, they use this time to elevate themselves. Rather than finding common ground, they tried to impress and tried to set themselves apart. The Lord calls them spots. That is, they stain the unity of the church. He calls them blemishes. They spoil the beauty of the fellowship. They come to church and they are like lions looking at a herd of gazelles. They hang around just waiting to see if there are someone who is vulnerable, someone they can take advantage of. They have an insatiable appetite for sin. What a condemnation. They never stop desiring sinful pleasure, even at church, even when the occasion is the Lord's Supper. And for some people, unfortunately, for some people in the church, they provide a false foundation. They entice unsteady souls. They look around for the newest and least mature of the congregation. When they find them, they fill their minds with half-truths, which we talked about last week was whole lies. One of the lies that they told grew in popularity to become a religious system of its own. What we see, I think, here in this chapter in Peter is perhaps an early version or one of the developing steps of Gnosticism. Gnosticism held that the soul could be freed by enlightenment through knowledge. Gnosis, gnosis, gnosko, to know, to learn. It also held that matter, flesh, is evil and unredeemable. Now this played out with the false teachers where they would tell their victims, the soul is saved, but the body is not. So you can do whatever you want with your body. This gave the unsteady, those who were spiritually unstable or immature, a false foundation. And what these false teachers really wanted is seen in their true motivation. Verse 14 says, they have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, verse 15 says, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Now, we saw this in verse 3 last week. These are greedy people. They only want to enrich themselves and please themselves. They are not a part of the church for God's sake or to be there to follow Jesus' examples or to help build up the church. They are in the church to see how much they can get out of the church. 
personally, physically, emotionally, and financially. This is where our introductory story of Balaam comes in. Balaam is held as a bad example of a prophet. He was on his way to a big payday when the Lord's angel stood in his way. Balaam could not be trusted. He was blind to the truth. His donkey was more spiritually aware than Balaam. A dumb animal was smarter than the prophet. An animal with no voice was a better spokesman than the prophet. These false teachers are like Balaam, in it for themselves. And the next picture was particularly vivid for those who lived in a dry climate. Have you ever experienced heat lightning? During the summer, you can have thunderheads develop. They look like rain clouds, but all they do is produce big wind and lightning and thunder. If there's a drought going on, these storms, like the false teachers, offer false promises. Verse 17 calls them waterless springs. And mists driven by a storm. The word mists refers to dark clouds. For those who are thirsty for righteousness, these false teachers offer nothing. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. But these false teachers offer them nothing of spiritual value. They're at an empty hole, a dry well, a cloud with no rain. The picture of the dark cloud is carried over from their false promises to their true prospects. The gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for them. Now, this is one of the eternal judgment pictures that, that we often miss God is light. Jesus is the light of the world. In heaven, there is no need for lamp or light because of the incandescent glow of God. Revelation 21, 23 says, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the lamb, is Jesus. In hell, there is no light. There's no presence of God. There's no light of Jesus. There's only gloomy darkness forever. Eternal gloom, never-ending darkness. That is the true prospects of the false teachers. We didn't read this a minute ago, but verse 18 says, For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh, Those who are barely escaping or freshly escaping, newly escaping from those who live in error. 19 says, they promise them freedom. They they promise freedom. This is a false salvation. Do you remember the story from Genesis 3 that we opened with today? Satan lied to Eve. He promised something that he could not deliver. It seemed like a good idea. The fruit was appealing. The promise of knowledge was enticing. Being like God was exciting. All of the lies and the deception were designed to charm the senses. The victims of the false teachers are usually those who have recently come to the Lord. They're new. They're fresh. They're willing to listen, especially they hear those who appeal to what they know, what they new in their past lives. So the false teachers make promises that are false. They offer a path to salvation that actually leads in the wrong direction. Like Satan, they want to take as many people with them because they know their true destination. Look at the second half of verse 19. They themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person to that He is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again entangle themselves in them and overcome, 
the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now, there's three things that I want you to note here. First off, the false teachers are not Christians. They are not slaves to righteousness, as Paul calls believers in Romans 6, 19. They are not described as bond servants of Christ. That's what Peter calls himself in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. They are slaves of corruption. They're not Christians. They're corrupt. Secondly, they've been fully exposed to the truth and they've rejected it. Coming into the church, being a part of a fellowship of believers does not ensure salvation. Salvation ensures salvation. Believing and having faith in Jesus, forsaking your sin, accepting God's grace, these are the things which ensure salvation. Thirdly, these false teachers would have been better off to have never gotten involved with the church. Now that they have, they'll be held accountable. They'll be judged for what they have known and what they have rejected. They are condemning themselves by leading others astray. To Peter, these people are just gross. He quotes a proverb that says, a dog returns to its own vomit. <laughs> Nasty. Let me, uh, let me close this discussion on false teachers with three things that are true for you. We can call this the truth about you. One, you can be influenced. You can be influenced. So be careful who you follow. Pay attention to what the Word says. Pay attention to what the person teaching says and make sure that what they're teaching matches up with God's Word. You can be influenced. Be careful who you follow. Number two, you, yes you, you are an influencer. So be careful the image that you project. People are watching you, especially if they know you're a Christian. They are watching you, so you are an influencer. Be careful the image that you project. And if you're a teacher, be very careful of the things that you teach. And then thirdly, you are immaculate. Be careful not to return. You are immaculate. You are clean. You are pure. When we accept Christ, we are cleaned up. Our sin is washed away. We've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, the gospel hymn says. You are immaculate. Be careful. He closes with a picture of a pig that's cleaned, washed, returning to the mud. You're clean. Be careful to not go back to the places that would soil you, that would degrade you that would make you dirty. You're saved, yes. You're clean, certainly. Be careful not to return. You can be influenced. You can be an influencer. And you are immaculate if you know Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look into your word today. Lord, we see that through Peter we can know that you do not like false teachers, not at all. There's nothing good said about someone that would try to deceive or corrupt or manipulate the church and church members. There's nothing good to be said for those that would take advantage of people that are new to the faith. Father, we know from Satan in the garden, from Balaam, from other examples, that you really, especially the example of Jesus, you really don't have much good to think about corruption. Especially not corruption in your house. Especially not corruption when it addresses your children. 
Lord, help us to learn this lesson well. Help us to be keenly aware of what your word says. That's our best defense. That's our only real defense. Trusting you, making sure we're in correct fellowship with you, and then learning what your word says. Lord, that's our defense against the faults. Help us to learn that. And Father, if there's someone watching this today and they've been influenced throughout their lives and they just are not sure that the influences in their lives have not confirmed for them that they can be immaculate, they can be clean, they can be pure, they can be your child. Lord, today let them believe who Jesus is, who your word says he is, everything about him. Let, let them acknowledge who they are, that they're not perfect, they could never be perfect, and they can't work their way into heaven. Father, let them turn away from doing wrong, turn away from sin, and trust Jesus. And then let them confess that. Let them tell someone else about that. And Father, by admitting and believing and confessing, we know your word promises that we can be saved. So that's my prayer for anyone listening today that doesn't have that confidence, that doesn't know Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.